To have faith is also to have doubt. There are so many questions we have, and we let them pile up. And so we keep taking those questions, and we keep putting them aside. Because we're scared to ask, or scared to know the answers. If I have not met you yet, I am Brandy Horton. I'm one of the pastors here at First Methodist Houston, and I am often not downtown, um, but it is good to be here this morning. We're beginning week two of our Ask Me Anything series, so you all control what gets said in the sermon series in the coming weeks, and it is always a really fun way to get to know what's going on in our congregation. I've found that the questions tell us what people are currently wrestling with, and they tell us kind of what it is that's on your hearts and on your minds, and I'm thankful for that insight. I'm also thankful that we are going to have a conversation this morning, Anne and I, instead of uh, just one of us going up here solo, because it is I find it to be easier to have Anne's uh, holiness and faithfulness to fall back on when I fail. Um, and so, um, but, uh, so we'll be having a conversation this morning and um, I hope that you enjoy kind of the, the diversity of our voices that the two of us bring. So let's start with the first question. How did Jesus choose his 12 apostles? You know, I don't think scripture, and I'm pretty sure scripture is not clear on this at all. It doesn't give us a list of criteria for what the disciples were like. And I wonder if when you were writing this question, whoever you are, if that's what you were looking for, is the question of how can I be faithful? And I think that the the one thing that the, um, the Bible does tell us about the 12 apostles is that they said yes, and they followed. Another thing that I would note about them is that they are kind of intentionally diverse, and I, I say intentionally, thinking that Jesus did it on purpose, but you have Simon, the zealot, so Simon wants to overthrow the government, and you have Matthew, the tax collector, who literally works for the government, and so in the 12 disciples, you kind of already embody this far-reaching inclusion that Jesus will come to preach later on in his ministry. And so I think that that's an important thing to note, that already from the outset, the disciples have um, kind of a, a, a body that is not all the same and not all alike. Do you have thoughts on that? I sure can. Well, I really love this question, and whoever uh, turned it in, thank you very much. My father was, uh, in his later life, decided that he wanted to study the disciples and find out where each one of them went. And we don't know the answer to that. But every time I would go home and visit with him, he would sit me down and say, let me tell you all about Jesus' disciples and what I learned. First of all, a disciple is a learner. Mm -hmm. Whenever Jesus first yeah. gathered them together, he taught them. And then an apostle is one who is called out. So after he taught them, and there were many, many disciples, then he said, you 12 are the ones that are gonna go out and continue with my work. When you stop and think about it, if you have ever been a, a manager or you've had people under you, if you're not really careful to get them organized, you're going to have absolute chaos. And I think that's what Jesus did. He pulled them together after he saw how they learned. He, they became apostles. They were called out. They were organized. They knew what to do, even though, of course, they were so human. And like Brandy said, they made so many different mistakes. But 
Brandy also said they were ordinary people with different personalities. And I think we can look at that today as that we are still being called to go out. We may think we're not the best or we don't do it very well, but Jesus is still saying, I need you with your personality, the way I made you to go out in the world and tell other people about me. The only thing that I would, the only thing that that kind of made me think of was that um, the word disciple in Greek actually means to learn. And so, um, and so I wonder if there was a certain quality about them that had this willingness to learn that we don't hear of in scripture, but was something that perhaps Jesus saw in them. And so I wonder if we had a posture of being a learner, what that could do for our relationship with God and for how we follow Jesus. And I think the Greek word for apostle is messenger. It is. A messenger to go out taking everything that we've learned out in the world. So I told you a little earlier about Haiti. So we were actually messengers taking the love of hmm. God out to a completely different country where they are struggling. And yeah, we were five different personalities completely, but we each did our part in, in taking the name of Jesus someplace else. Are you okay. ready for question two? I'm ready. In the Bible, it says the dead in Christ shall rest until the day of resurrection. Yet often people say, he, she's in heaven right now. I don't agree. What do you think? What do you think? Right before my mother died, she was getting ready to go to a hospice, she asked, actually asked me that question. Hmm. I was still in school and learning, and I really didn't quite know how to answer her. Because as you're reading your Bible, you can look in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you can see both. You can see that we sleep for a while until Jesus comes, and then you also read about the thief on the cross. We just studied that, we just had that. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. So often you'll be at a funeral and the pastor will say, well, Henry is in heaven today and he's with God and he's not hurting anymore. But actually in the Bible, there is something for both. And Actually, until the day that we get there, that is somewhat of a mystery. Mm -hmm. It's a mystery. Will it be one? Will it be the other? And there also is the possibility of both. Right. I read that, um, where was I reading something the other day that I watched on television about Einstein? And that Einstein studied the fact that everything is in a sequence but that in that sequence, things can yet be happening at one time. Hmm. So is it possible that it could be both hmm. together? I know I explained it to my mother. I said, you know, we really don't know, but I said, I want you to think of a day in your home and it's raining and the rain is coming down on the roof and you're sleepy and you close your eyes and you just think, oh my gosh, this is the best sleep ever. And then you wake up much later than you plan to sleep. I kind of think that must be what it's like yeah. whenever you fall asleep and if our bodies do rest, that at the time, our time is like, oh my gosh, this is forever. But God's time is so, so different. So it's a mystery, but the Old and New Testaments have uh, indications of both. Yeah, I, I would have gone with a, a both and too, um, because it is in scripture as a, as a both and. I would also say um, that 
I've noticed that there's a lot of questions this round about heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. um, and so it seems like we're wrestling with this. And uh, scripture is not 100% clear on all of those issues. And so I think that one of the things that we can do both as people in the pews and for us as pastors is to hold our interpretations of what, it, what heaven is like with kind of an open hand. Instead of having this closed grip on this is what it has to be and this is how I believe it, what if instead we say scripture is not clear and it's okay to kind of wonder um, and to not be sure. I would also say that we do affirm a bodily resurrection um, always because of the, re the way that Jesus was resurrected, that it is a resurrection of our body, that as people we are both body and soul. Um, my husband is much smarter than I am, and he said to me one day, uh, we were preparing for two different funerals, and he said, don't you think that death is kind of this unnatural breaking of your body and your soul? because you are both at the same time. And so when you die, your body is dead, but perhaps your soul goes to be with God. And he, and he was just wondering aloud, this is what happens in clergy couple households as we talk about these things. And I thought about how unnatural death actually is, that God is a God of life. And so death is not the way that things are supposed to be. And whether he's right or wrong, it doesn't really matter to me in that I know that there is hope at the end of the day. The other thing that was kind of rolling around in my head um, with this was that when people say he or she's in heaven now, I think there's some comfort in that. And um, one of the things that we talked about uh, when I was a chaplain at Duke Hospital was you can walk into a hospital room and someone can be telling you the worst theological thing in the entire world, whatever that is for you, and unless you have something better to replace it with, don't dismantle the thing that they are holding on to, the thing that is giving them hope. And so if you encounter someone that has just lost a loved one, and that is the thing that is giving them hope that they are in heaven, then let that go um, because, you know, it, it's, the, it's a grace to them uh, to be able to, to cling to something in that moment. I know people during funerals will come up to me and they're, you know, just like Brandy said, they have a lot of questions. But there's one scripture I always go mm. back to and that scripture actually grounds me. In the Bible, it says, there is nothing, nothing, nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Absolutely. And it lists angels and demons, and it goes through the whole thing. And you have to look at that, and you have to read it like it is written. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And sometimes I think after we die, and we have been as faithful as we can possibly be, the love that Jesus has for us in our death, not only does he love us in our life, but he loves us in our death. And, and we are precious. It's, doesn't it say, blessed are the saints that die? Uh, yes, yeah, that scripture. Does. I mean, just think about that. Just think about, there is absolutely nothing that can separate you or your loved ones from the love of God. I hold on to that. Yeah, that's really a nice way to end, but I'm gonna go down a rabbit hole <laughs> because it came to my mind, and I don't know that I actually have a point with this, except for that um, my ethics professor in seminary, his specialty was on uh, Christians dying. And so um, he looked at, how to die well as a person of faith. And I, um, I only read one of his books, I think, but when I think about that, what it tells me is that there is a way to live and to die well. Um, and so that gives me some things to think about as, um, as a person who, even though I'm young, tomorrow is not always assured. And so how are we living in such a way that our dying is also a, uh, a death well done. Um, you may want to get us the name of that book, and I can email it. 
I would be happy to. Um, yeah, I can't I remember. I, I see some head shaking. That I, <laughs> his I would name, like to see that. His too. name was uh, Dr. Alan Verhey, and he um, he actually died while I was in his class. Um, and he, um, oddly enough, uh, he was a specialist on Christian dying, and he went to sleep one night and never woke up. Um, and I read an article about um, a mother of, I think she had like four or five children, and she knew she was going to die, and the kids were like teenagers. And so she went through and wrote each of them a note, hmm. and then she hid the notes all over the house. Wow. So that at Christmas time, when they got out the decorations, there was a letter to all of them from wow. mom. And then she had her girlfriends actually take letters to the individual children and mail them. I mean, can you imagine getting a handwritten letter from your mother and your mother has been gone for, you know, wow. maybe a year? But it gave those children such comfort mm -hmm. that they started looking all over the house for <laughs> the letters and what did mom want to say to us before she died. She died well. Mm. She died well. Yeah. Okay, are you ready? I think ready? we're ready for question three. three. Is salvation secure after you profess Jesus as Savior? Can you lose it? Is grace enough? My immediate gut reaction, um, and maybe this is because I'm such a Methodist, but my immediate reaction is to say that grace is always enough. Um, that grace all it covers everything. And I think I would say too that, um, and Anna, if you want to argue with me on this, you can. Okay. <laughs> um, that salvation I'm a and. Methodist too. <laughs> um, that salvation and grace are not exactly the same thing. Um, that salvation is the grace that saves us, and I, I know you're not going to argue on that point, um, that there, there is a grace that saves us, but that grace covers the whole process of life. Um, that there is never a moment that we are beyond the grace of God. Um, I think about this, and when I think about the reasons that we do infant baptism, we believe that God has claimed that child from the beginning, and that God loves that child from the beginning. So grace is that unmerited, undeserved, unworked for love of God. And that grace, whether you choose to accept it or not, is going to be present no matter what. But if you accept the grace of God, then there's that salvation peace there, um, that when you accept that grace in your life, that you are saved. And this is where I think I'm, I might go off the rail, but maybe not, is that when we ask this question, I think sometimes we think we're asking about fire insurance. Um, am I going to heaven or am I going to hell? But I'm wondering if instead salvation might be more about life insurance, about once you're saved, living into that grace. Jesus talks a lot more about life here on earth than he does about life after death. And so I'm thinking that when, when you are saved, that you, can, you start to live this life of grace and that you become more and more like Jesus as you live. I'm also thinking that there is a way to refuse that grace. Even after you've accepted it, you can refuse it. And so um, we're not once saved, always saved people as United Methodists. We do believe that we have free will and that we can turn away. And that's a hard truth, I think, to, to swallow. Um, it's not just about one prayer one time. It's about a life lived in the grace of God. We went into a home in Haiti, and it was a really large family. And it was a mother, and she had several daughters. One daughter uh, was diagnosed with cancer, and the mother, of course, was just beyond herself, just, you know, wanting prayer and saying, I don't want to have to see my daughter. I don't want to have to bury my daughter, mm. her daughter sitting right there. But there was another girl sitting over there holding a tiny infant. And uh, one of the translators said, ask her why she doesn't go to church. And so I did, I asked that question. They translated it. And what she was trying, she goes, she was trying to tell me, 
I did something bad. Mm. I can't go to church. Mm. I think what she was trying to tell me in maybe, I don't know, Methodist terminology, that she was a backslider. <laughs> you know, she had made some mistakes. She had that baby out of wedlock, mm. and it was really bothering her, and her church would not accept her. And so if her church didn't accept her, she wasn't about to go. And so, Brandy, we talked just about this whole thing, about how that you are loved and forgiven and covered in this grace. And we encouraged her, maybe she went to a different church than her mother. We encouraged her, why don't you go with your mother to church and just remember, you are so loved. It's kind of like our lives are a series of we take two steps forward, and then we kind of goof up a little bit, and we take a step backwards. And the next time, we may make it three and go back two. But, I mean, even in the Bible, you see different biblical characters that did some backsliding. Oh. One of, well, you see lots of them. Yeah. <laughs> you see, like, um, Saul. You see him, I mean, he clearly was backsliding. You read about the different churches that um, they would write about, Paul would write about, and he goes, you've lost your first love, or you're doing this. You read about some of the maybe other disciples that just gave it up. Mm -hmm. And so I think in life, we, it's gonna happen. It's going to happen. We're going to backslide, but we can keep coming forward. Like Wesley would say, work out your own and salvation. salvation. Yeah. You work on that every day. And if there's something that happened in your life that you're ashamed of or whatever, there, there's, you confess it. Be restored. Go again. Yeah, and I think, too, that when, when we feel like we've backslid or something like that, that the grace of God, uh, there's a song that we sing at the source about the, 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 the reckless love of God is what it says. Um, but the idea is that the grace of God is going to keep seeking after you and is going to move everything aside to get to you. When we baptized our daughter, um, and she was, she's an infant, so we, um, we did the provenient grace kind of belief. Um, but when we baptized our daughter, Dr. Tom Pace uh, from St. Luke's United Methodist Church told this story um, that I have gone back to a couple of times. So when Lutherans baptize anyone, they make the, the mark of a cross on your forehead. And um, one of our friend's husbands is a Lutheran pastor, and he, uh, he's a campus minister, and so he would call all of the Lutheran students that were coming to Rice uh, when they got on campus. And he would make the phone call and he would say, why don't, why don't you come and join our student ministry? And if they said no, or if they didn't show up, he would say, that's fine, but the mark on your forehead is not going away. And so, and so this idea that they didn't have to be participating in what they were doing, but that God still claimed them as his own, no matter what they did. And I think that's powerful, and I think it's true. I remember when I was in college, I was raised in a, from cradle um, in a Methodist home, really devout parents and grandparents. And I just remember when I got to college, I thought I was really cool and I did not want to go to church anymore. And my poor dad, he was not happy with me, but I thought that was great that he wasn't happy <laughs> with me. So there was a period of time that I just didn't go to church and I kind of like did my own thing. I didn't do anything horrible ever, but, um, but I can remember when I came back and that beautiful grace that mm. covered me to again, again. And sometimes the choir sings, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. And there's one of the verse, verses in there, and I'm not quoting it exactly, but Jesus rescued me when a sinner mm. saw me wandering away from the fold of God. And then he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. I tell you, every single time we sing that, my lip starts quivering 
because that was me. And I came back and all that grace just whoop, went right over me again and I was able to go on. So it's just one of those wonderful, wonderful things. You, you can backslide. You can say, that's it, I'm not gonna do this. But like Brandy said, that grace is always chasing after you. It'll never stop. Do we have time for the fourth one? Or I not? think we may have a few more. Okay. We can try. Okay. Are there any pastors or podcasters that you like and appreciate their messages? Your recommendations, please. So I guess this is our softball last question. Um, so I actually should probably own the fact that I don't really listen to other pastors preach. Um, yeah, that's probably something I really shouldn't say out loud, but there we go. Um, and I should, I really should. David and I have this conversation all the time about we might be better preachers if we just listen to other pastors preach or if we listen to each other preach or something like that. But I often don't listen to other pastors, but I am a podcast listener. And the reason that I listen to podcasts is um, I listen to podcasts beca uh, for information that's not church related. I listen to podcasts, I listen to a lot of storytelling podcasts, and I'll tell you names in a second. I listen to a lot of storytelling podcasts because I think that part of my job is to learn to tell the story well. And if I listen to other people telling stories, then I might be able to articulate my own in a better way. And I listen to podcasts about, um, about science and things like that. But pastors that I read, um, I read um, Lauren Winner, she's Episcopalian. She was one of my uh, professors at school. She studies Christian spirituality. I like her a lot. Um, I read Barbara Brown Taylor, who's probably, in my opinion, maybe one of the best preachers in America right now. She's also Episcopalian. But both of those people I read, I don't listen to. Um, but podcast, I listen to a podcast called The Moth. Um, and I'm gonna say that, again, not Christian, so some of the topics are not necessarily churchy things. Some of the words are not necessarily churchy words, um, but the concept is that they, uh, they tell a story without notes. And that's often what I'm doing, is telling a story without notes. And um, I listen to This American Life, and I listen to um, a podcast that I just got into that I was telling Tommy about at the back. It's called Invisibilia, and it is about um, unseen forces that help, um, that form human relationships. So it's how humans relate to each other, which I think is fascinating. So, um, I would love to listen to sermons on television, particularly watch the whole thing, but I have a slight conflict, and it's called My Husband Who Watches Ice Road Truckers, Swamp Monsters, <laughs> uh, every sport there is, and he video, I mean, downloads every single thing about the war, and so trying to get that TV away from him is hard. I could go in the kitchen, but that's not comfortable. I mean, I'd have to sit at the kitchen table. So I really struggle. But I have a great friend, you're gonna see her in a minute. Her name is Ruthie Estes, and she watches all of the pastors. And she's constantly emailing me, you need to listen to this. Ch pull up this guy and listen to him. And then she sends me quotes. Well, this is the quote that I got out of that one. <laughs> and I don't do a lot of podcasts, but I tell you, I do read. And Barbara Brown Taylor is one of mine. I'm constantly reading books on preaching. But I really love John Ortberg, mm -hmm. and I love Max Lucado because he writes very simply, and he's humorous. And I know that I handed my son one of his books called Facing Your Giants, was the story of David and Goliath. And that one book, even though he knew Jesus, it brought him back again. And he decided he wanted to face his giants. Mm. So I have a variety of different authors that I love uh, to listen to. I particularly love to watch things on television like Nova, anything about, that's where I learned about Albert Einstein. Huh. Like the other day there was something on there, is God a mathematician? 
<laughs> and talking about how the universe is so ordered according to numbers. Mm -hmm. And so all of that helps me as I begin to prepare for sermons and, you know, I'm like you though, I don't listen to a lot of, of other pastors. So anyway, yeah. yeah, okay. Well, we hope that some of these questions just really touched you and thank you all so much for writing them and brandy it was just so great yeah. to work with you you know you're hearing our opinions you're hearing what what we think and what we have learned in all of our seminary classes but you take those same questions and go home and do some more research on them there's a lot about um, once saved, always saved in the Presbyterian and the Baptist church. And then you can read that and compare that with the Methodist denomination. There's so many different things that you can learn just from these questions. Maybe you have a small group. Maybe you meet in a Sunday school class. Take them with you. Get other people's opinions on them too. Don't just leave them here. Don't leave them right here in the building. Just carry them out and keep thinking on them.